one of the key pieces of trigonometry that allows us to continue on to actually solve trigonometric equations, simplify trigonometric expressions that occur later on in mathematics, is the work with trigonometric identities. Now, remember in algebra, if I have an equation and I have a conditional equation, it's true on the condition that I have the values of x that make the equation true. So those equations are true for some values in their domain, and we have as our job to find the values of the variables that make the equation true. If I have an impossible equation, there's no values in the domain that would make the equation true. But if I have an identity, that means that equation is true for all values of the domain. Now, the thing is that in algebra, pretty much we could identify the ones that were going to be identity equations because the left side looked really close to the right side in the beginning and then as you worked through you got exactly the same thing on the left as you did on the right. Now with trig there are a lot of identities that aren't as easily identified so we want to put them to memory and really get comfortable with what the identities are so that we can use them as replacements as we go through the further process in trig. So we're going to start with the eight fundamental trig identities, do a couple examples here, and then in other videos we'll work some different applications of just having us continually practicing our trig identities and expand our knowledge of other trig identities so that we have a strong foundation when we need to use these later on. Now, the eight fundamental trig identities, and I know I didn't list all eight yet, but they are the ones that we've kind of been alluding to even as we built the ideas of trig all along. Now, these eight fundamental trig identities come in some subgroups. The first subgroup are the reciprocal trig identities. The second is the ratio trig identities. And then the third is the Pythagorean identities. So the first set are the reciprocal trig identities. And we saw, even when we were back to the basic definition, that the sine of an angle is defined to be y over r, and the cosecant of the angle was defined to be r over y, so they were reciprocals of each other. And that's what this is saying. The sine of theta is equal to the reciprocal of cosecant of theta. So it's not new news. They're writing it differently. They're calling it an identity now, but it's something that we already have been introduced to. So if sine theta is equal to one over cosecant theta, then cosecant theta is equal to one over sine theta. They're reciprocals of each other. Cosine theta is the reciprocal of secant theta. So cosine theta is one over secant theta. Also, we would have that secant theta is one over cosine theta. Tangent theta is the reciprocal of cotangent theta. So tangent theta is equal to 1 over cotangent theta, and cotangent theta would be equal to 1 over tangent theta. We just write one of the cases, and we usually write the most comfortable trig function equal to the reciprocal of the trig function that we don't use very often. And basically because they don't have the calculator keys, they're not in the original definition. Now, here comes our ratio identities. Tangent theta can also be thought of as the sine of the angle divided by the cosine of the angle. And we saw that also back when we were defining our trig relationships. Well, since tangent theta is the reciprocal of cotangent theta and vice versa, I can write cotangent theta is cosine theta over sine theta. Now for the uh, Pythagorean identities. Sine squared theta meaning take sine of theta and square it plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. Now this happens because of the Pythagorean theorem with our triangle, our right triangle. We've got our x-coordinate, our y-coordinate, and then our hypotenuse. And that's just a setup with the square of the leg plus the square of the leg is equal to the square of the hypotenuse on the unit circle. Now the reason I left the last two off to start with is that I can get these other two by basing it off of this sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. So if I go through and just think, if I divide everything through by sine squared theta, 
all the way through both sides. Then sine squared theta divide by sine squared theta, well that's just one, plus cosine squared theta divide by sine squared theta is cosine theta divided by sine theta quantity squared. Well, cosine theta divided by sine theta is cotangent theta. So this is going to be cotangent squared theta is equal to, and one divided by sine squared theta is just one divided by sine theta quantity squared. And the reciprocal of sine theta is my cosecant theta. So this is gonna be cosecant squared theta. Now the other one, the eighth one of the eight tri fundamental trig identities, we're going to still come back to this sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1, and we're going to divide everything through by cosine squared theta. So then sine squared theta divided by cosine squared theta is sine theta divided by cosine theta quantity squared. Sine theta divided by cosine theta is tangent theta. So I have tangent squared theta plus 1 is equal to, and 1 mm -hmm. over cosine squared theta is going to be my secant squared theta. So that finishes up with the 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 fundamental trig identities. Now let's see how this can play out with simplifying an expression. I want to add these two fractions and they don't have the same denominator. So we're going to build this fraction top and bottom by sine x to get the common denominator. So if I build this top and bottom by sine x, and the other one top and bottom by 1 minus cosine x, I'm going to get sine squared x over sine x times 1 minus cosine x plus foil out the numerator. That'll be 1 minus 2 cosine x plus cosine squared x. Add the numerator and keep the common denominator we have sine squared x plus 1 minus 2 cosine x plus cosine squared x. Over my denominator of sine x times 1 minus cosine x. And when I look at what terms I have, I have a sine squared x term plus a cosine squared x term. So sine squared x plus cosine squared x, I take sine squared um, x plus cosine squared x out and put in the number 1. So we're going to bring this over here. That's 1 plus 1 minus 2 cosine x over the sine x times 1 minus cosine x. Well, 1 plus 1 is 2, and that's going to give me a common factor of 2 between these terms. So if I factor out a 2, then um, I have a common factor of 1 minus cosine x, top and bottom. And so that actually simplifies all the way down to 2 over sine x. Now we saw this expression in an earlier video, or one very similar to it, but it was before we did anything with the trig identities. So we left it at this point here instead of making that substitution with the trig identity and finishing it off. Okay, now sometimes they'll have us actually verify an identity. When you're verifying an identity, you can't move things from the left side of the equal sign to the right side, nor can you multiply both sides by the same quantity because you're verifying this identity. You don't know it is one yet. What you can do is make substitutions from the identities that you already know. And also, if there's identities that are proven and that you know they are true, you can rearrange the terms of these 
known identities to make substitutions. You just can't rearrange side to side of one that you're verifying. So what I want to do is make replacements on one side of the equation and simplify to see if I can make it look like the other side. So here tangent x, I'm going to leave that as tangent x because I see that I have tangent squared x on the other side, so I don't want to get rid of a trig function that I want in the expression. But secant x, I don't want to keep that because I don't have it on what I'm trying to build towards. I look and secant x is the reciprocal of cosine x. So I'm going to take this secant x expression out and put 1 over cosine x in its place. And then sine x, I'm going to write sine x over 1 just to remember what that is. Now, think about multiplying across the top and across the bottom. I have tangent x times, this would be sine x over cosine x. But sine x over cosine x is tangent x. So this gives me tangent x times tangent x, which is tangent x quantity squared. And when we write qu tangent x quantity squared in its more concise so that we don't need to use the parentheses, the convention of how to write that, it comes tangent squared x, which is exactly what the other side is. So here we did several different things. We looked at the eight fundamental trig identities, and then we looked at one example where it was just an expression that we were asked to simplify, but then another one where it was an equation that we were asked to verify that that equation indeed was an identity.